Chapter 24. The safe house they were taken to was in El Paso, Texas. Had there been no border to cross, no wall, no security to avoid, they could have walked over the bridge and been at the house in 20 minutes. Instead, the journey had taken most of the night. But what did it matter? After all this time, weeks or even months, since his parents had woken him up in the middle of the night, they had finally made it. Two stories high and impressive, the safe house looked exactly like its neighbors on the quiet street, as if the builder had lacked creativity after the first one. Still, they must have been in a very rich neighborhood because there were no bars on the doors and windows, and each house had a small garden up front with planted desert flowers bordered by neat gravel. Doña Paloma, a stout Mexican woman who ran the house, glared at Angela holding Vita in her arms. You're not coming in here with that dog, but Jaime and Angela started to say. But Doña Paloma shook her head. Has she been vaccinated? Has she been treated for fleas and ticks? Doña Paloma raised an eyebrow, though she already knew the answers to her questions. So what are you going to do? Are you sending us back? Tears welled up in Angela's eyes. Jaime squeezed her hand tight and hoped she understood her message. If Doña Paloma threatened to send them back, they'd run away. Under no circumstances were they getting sent back to Guatemala now that they were here. Doña Paloma rolled her eyes inside. I'm strict, but not heartless. Tie her up in the back. Don't let her bark and clean up her messes. Gracias. When Jaime and Angela entered the house after a long reassurance to Vita that they weren't leaving her for long and that she had to behave, Doña Paloma lined them up behind the other three who'd been in the car. The closed door in front of them led to a shower. The water is on a timer for three minutes. There's light shampoo and disinfectant soap in there, which you must use, Doña Paloma commanded. Once you're clean, you can pick out a new set of clothes. During his turn, Jaime scrubbed himself and rubbed the smelly shampoo into his scalp quickly before spending the remaining 84 seconds enjoying the lukewarm water pouring down his head. Back home, with no indoor plumbing in his house, showers meant standing outside in the rain. This really was the land of dreams and opportunity. One room held bags of donated clothes heaped on top of a long table. Most of them were old and frayed, but compared to what he'd been wearing during their whole journey, a shirt he'd cut to bind Angela's ankle and the ink-stained jeans that almost fell off and had a rip in the thigh, anything, new, felt like a treat. He picked out a red and white striped shirt, a faded but intact pair of blue jeans, and some white socks that looked new. His shoes he kept, they were smellier than rotten cheese but still worked. The Batman underwear he picked was a bit tight on the waist, but sometimes you needed to sacrifice comfort for coolness. His old clothes went into a heap where they would be washed, mended, and offered to someone else. Angela chose mid-calf aqua green pants, a flowery shirt, and sandals. After having worn plain, blending in collars, she wanted something pretty. They hadn't slept all night, but there was something else they needed to do before crashing in one of the three rooms crammed with bunk beds. The mantra Jaime had memorized in Tapachula came back to him as he tapped his leg in rhythm. 5-7, five, 5-5, five, 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 21, 86. Doña Paloma let everyone use her phone for two minutes to call anywhere in Los Estados Unidos. Jaime swallowed a few times to clear his dry throat. He could feel his heart pounding through his whole body. He couldn't do it. They'd have to communicate a different way. Email, maybe. Something where he could plan what he would say. He had never made a phone call in his life. Tomasa's voice recording sounded foreign as he asked callers to leave a message. At least that was what Jaime guessed, he said. The recording was in English and he called himself Tom. Jaime licked his lips and took a deep breath to calm his nervous heart. What if Tomas didn't get the message? What if he never came? Ah, uh, hi, it's me, Jaime, your brother. We're here, me and Angela, in El Paso, 2910, Weju. You pronounce it Willow, Angela interrupted over his shoulder. Ah, Willow, a street, he corrected. See you soon? And he hung up quickly, his face red and heart hammering to in his ears like he'd just crossed the border again. Angela chuckled and pushed him playfully on the shoulder. You really need to work on your English. They woke up at lunchtime to some very strange food. Doña Paloma had prepared sandwiches with some kind of salty brown nutty spread and sweet red mermelada. When they asked her what the sandwiches were, she said peanut butter and jelly. Jaime wasn't sure if he liked the combination. Salty, sweet, and sticky, but ate it anyway. His abuela would have been proud. The 16 other people staying at the house huddled around the giant television watching English soap operas and talk shows, but Jaime and Angela spent the afternoon outside with Vida. Doña Paloma had a nice backyard with a high fence that kept out peering neighbors who might report the suspicious amount of cousins she always had at her house. After spending weeks outdoors, it was strange being confined inside a house that reeked of bleach and insecticide. Jaime rescued his old holy socks before they were thrown away and managed to wad them up in a lumpy ball. 
Once Vita got over the fascinating smell, she learned to play fetch quickly. Every once in a while, she'd leap into the air with a great twist, flash the blue belly stitches Angela still needed one stitches Angela said still needed one more day, and land squarely on four paws with the sock ball in her mouth. Jaime could scarcely believe this was the same dog who'd survived a murderous dog fight, had been found with half of her innards showing, and then had been stitched up by kids before traveling across a dangerous country. It was a lot to go through, and most dogs wouldn't have made it. Most people wouldn't have either. I was expecting two of you, not three, a voice came from the back door. They both jumped and turned to the shape emerging from the shadows of the house. Jaime's face went from caramello brown to cafe with lots of milk. Angela went even paler. Miguel? She gasped. The figure at the door smiled, one side of his mouth going higher than the other. His eyes were so dark they couldn't be seen in the shadow except for the bright white surrounding them. He brushed his shaggy hair out of his face just like Miguel used to do. Everything like Miguel, but it wasn't Jaime's cousin. Tomas, Jaime whispered, but couldn't move any closer. Vita wiggled toward the stranger with her tail wagging, licking his legs as if he were a long-lost member of her pack. The figure stepped into the sunlight, wrinkles scrunched around the corners of his eyes. A scruffy beard grew on his cheeks. While in the shadows, he could have passed for a 12-year-old. Now in the sun, he looked older than his 25 years. But still, it was him, Jaime's brother. Well, are you two going to say hi? Tomas's smile widened to become more lopsided. Jaime and Angela ran the few paces to him and jumped into his arms, something they hadn't done since they were four and seven. Tomas hugged and kissed them both, then kissed and hugged them again. I can't believe you're here. Do you know how lucky you, do you know, do you two know how lucky you are? Images of others flashed through Jaime's head. The Salvadoran woman on the bus, the man under the bridge without any legs, Zavi. He thought of little Joaquin, Eva and Ivan from the train, and even crazy Rafa, and hoped they had been lucky as well. We, Jaime paused to look at Angela. Mother, mothering responsibilities forgotten, she still had her arms around Tomas, her head against his chest like a little girl. We had help from many people along the way. Pancho with his sacks of used clothes, Padre Kevin, who liked ridiculous outfits, Senora Perez, all of whom seemed to have been sent especially to help them. Jaime glanced up, the other two following his example, and stared at the pale blue sky without a cloud in sight. They stood there, feeling eyes looking at them from above, until Vita yipped and returned them to the backyard of a safe house in El Paso. I'm sorry about Miguel, Tomas said, rubbing both of their backs. He was a good kid, smart, good-looking took after his cousin. Jaime couldn't stop himself from grinning, except more humble. Tomas shook his head as if he didn't believe that and then smiled back. Let's have a look at you. He held them at arm's length. Angela, I wouldn't have recognized you. You're so beautiful. And you, hermanito, when did you start growing a mustache? Jaime bounded to the window to check out his reflection. It was faint, but sure enough, there were definitely some dark hairs growing on his upper lip. It's not real. I know you just drew it on, Angela teased. Jaime stuck out his tongue at her. We need to call our parents. They've been so worried. Tomas put his phone on speaker and called Tio Daniel, Angela's papa, the only one in their family with a phone. But it was Abuela who answered. Tomas, what is it? No, I don't want to know. Please don't tell me. Esta bien, Tomas reassured their grandmother. I have them. They're here. In serio? Abuela asked in disbelief. Tomas waved at them to speak. Hola, Abuela. Jaime and Angela said at the same time. Abuela gasped, and Jaime heard her start to cry. He imagined her holding her heart as she leaned against the counter full of her tortillas. Gracias, adios. I must tell everyone. The whole family has been praying for weeks. Bless you three. And she was gone. They stared at the phone for a few minutes after she hung up, thinking about Abuela and their parents, Guatemala and home. Come on, let's get going. Tomas put an armor on the two of them and kissed them once more on the top of their heads. They went through the house with Vita in Angela's arms and Jaime clutching Tomas's hand. They thanked Doña Paloma and Tomas slipped her some extra money for taking care of his family. They climbed into the red truck Tomas had borrowed from his boss and they drove out of El Paso, Texas and into Nuevo Mexico. They passed one checkpoint, but the officer just glanced in the truck and waved them along without even asking a question. Jaime turned to the last blank page in his sketchbook and tapped the remaining pencil stub on his lip as he wondered what to draw. Cacti covered the landscape along with flowering spiny plants. Cattle herds near the road and speckled in the distance were more common than people or houses. 
At one point, three brown and white bambies, which Tomas called pronghorn antelopes, leaped across the road. Sometimes they drove for 20 minutes without passing another car. Everything was big and sparse and nothing like home. During their journey, Jaime had only worried about getting to his brother in safety. Now a whole new set of concerns took over. What was it going to be like to live here? Where there was no one? Would he ever be able to speak English properly? What if he never stopped missing his family back home? What if, after everything, they still got deported? Next to him, Angela stared out the open window with Vita on her lap. She turned to look at him. With wide eyes and a deep breath, she mouthed, We made it. Jaime started sketching without realizing what he was drawing. The perspective was from behind instead of facing forward like he normally drew. He made rough lines into right angles until he had three-dimensional image of a rectangular box or the bed of a truck. From there, he worked on the back of the heads of each of the passengers, a shaggy, taller head on the driver's seat with one arm dangling out the window, a smaller head with shorter hair growing a mustache, even though that couldn't be seen. Next to the other window, long tresses whipped in the breeze from another head, and finally a white and brown patch mutt with one ear and a flapping tongue. You see that mountain over there, Tomas said. Millions of years ago, it used to be a volcano. Home is just on the other side. Jaime looked up and smiled. It was just like Pancho had said. In the background of his drawing, a volcano appeared. Instead of being lush with foliage and half hidden with fog, this volcano held clumps of brown green bushes with rocks on the top that seemed to wink in the setting sun. Together, as a family, they drove toward the volcano and their new home.